pero hay. Could I get your attention? Why is this not working? Could I call up my assistant? <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed breakfast. Um, uh, as I said, Di uh, has joined us. Um, and in a moment, I'll introduce uh, Andrea Walters, who's the uh, events manager at um, Endeavour Foundation has done a fabulous job putting this speaker series together. Um, there's another one in June and we hope to have further speakers um, as the years go by. And this, whilst this is an Endeavour Foundation initiative, it's, it's actually for the disability sector. Because uh, when I joined um, uh, Endeavour Foundation three years ago, um, I began to see that people with disability are some of the most marginalised, some of the uh, most impoverished uh, members of our society in this, in this very rich country of ours. Um, we hear uh, lots of debate about mining taxes and carbon taxes and for goodness sake this week we've been uh, hearing about <coughs> what choice of nannies you might get uh, under uh, a future government. Uh, all the time the uh, Productivity Commission report and a, and a recent report by PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, has rated people with a disability in this country as the poorest in the OECD. So out of 27 countries, uh, we're 27th. Now, if that was our swimming team's results from the London Olympics, there'd be a royal commission and several billion dollars directed towards fixing the issue. And yet, we still tolerate this. So the, the speaker series is about uh, addressing some of the more serious structural and underpinning problems that occur uh, in our society and to, and to um, engage the community in this debate and, and hopefully to inform you. Um, I have no doubt that Di will inform you, but, um, but as we go and, and get more speakers, we'd love your support. We'd like you to talk to uh, others about coming along uh, and embracing this uh, speaker series and uh, bringing more and more people from the community to hear about the circumstances that face uh, people with disability. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, you didn't come here this morning to listen to me, so I'll stop now. I'd like to introduce uh, Andrea, uh, who will uh, uh, introduce Di Pinto. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thanks, David. Uh, it's a great privilege to introduce Di Penegast, who is speaking on disability and the law, risks versus rights. Many of you will already be familiar with Diane. She was admitted to practice law in 1987 and has practiced both privately and within the public service since then. She was the adult guardian for Queensland from 2006 to 2011. During that period, she made decisions for adults unable to make their own decisions, including in the challenging area of end of life decision making. She also oversaw investigations of abuse, neglect, and exploitation of adults who lacked decision making capacity. Nowadays, she practices as a barrister at the private bar, is a sessional member of the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal, and is a nationally accredited mediator. Diane is authorised to investigate issues around the care and protection of forensic disability clients, is a member of the Law Society's Elder Law Committee, and is the legal member of the Human Research Ethics Committee. She's also Queensland Secretary of Australian and New Zealand Psychiatrists, Psychologists and Lawyers. Please join me in welcoming Di to the podium. I've also recently had an encounter of the worst kind with the banana bus going the wrong way on the M1. So I'm well and truly credentialed to talk to you this morning about disability as it affects all of us, even if it's those on the M1 today. Um, I'd like to start off by uh, acknowledging David Barbagello um, and the work that he's doing with the support of the Endeavour Foundation. The comments that David made are apt and they are correct. When you think that the Declaration of Human Rights was first propounded over 60 years ago, and when you think of the state of play for people with disability in Australia today, not only in Queensland but in Australia, it's unacceptable. Um, there was a very tragic event that occurred on our beaches 
over the last few days. And it was something that struck very deeply to me because my son, who's 14 years of age, volunteers every month as a surf lifesaver at Southport, which is one of the roughest beaches on the Gold Coast. We have had many dramatic events and our hearts all go out to that family. But there will be more time spent, there will be more investigation, there will be more consideration of what's happened to that boy than there will be to the many thousands of boys who will be born this year with disability in Australia. I'm not saying that talking about what happened on the beach this week isn't important and relevant, it is. I am saying we lack proportion about the things that we talk about, the things that we don't talk about, and why we don't talk about them. The comments that I'm making today, I should point out, are my comments. They're not the comments of the Adult Guardian of Queensland, although they do arise from my experience in that role, and they're not the comments of the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal, um, although I am a sessional member. They really arise from the five years that I spent as the adult guardian and the subsequent time that I've had to consider that experience and to think about what happens to people who confront the legal system in Queensland. I've written a great speech. It's 19 pages long. <laughs> I am not going to read it to you. In fact, I'm probably not going to talk to a lot of it. I hope it's a valuable resource and I will give it to the Endeavour Foundation to put on their website and make available to you. Um, but we are now living in a can-do state where I think that we need to be more than ever thinking about the global state of play in terms of human rights, but more particularly in the way we talk about it, talking about what actually happens and what we can actually do. One of the main problems that I find with human rights is that human rights are aspirational. They're talking about a life that I never saw any of the people that I worked with live. They're talking about dreams. And dreams are great because dreams tell us what we should be aiming for. But many people espouse human rights without actually knowing what the value of the conversation is. And what it does, in my experience, to decision makers is it turns them off. People in Down Street, George Street, don't want to know about um, human rights conventions. They don't want to know about what the articles say. They put it in documents, but it isn't something that they w actually want to know about. What they want to know about is what you want to do about it and what it's going to cost. And every conversation that you have with someone who has an opportunity to make a change for people with disabilities needs to acknowledge and needs to think about what human rights is about but shouldn't be couched in that language because you're not going to get into people's minds if you start talking about the dream and you ignore the reality of what people's lives are. One of the great experiences that I've had since I left the role of Adult Guardian is that I've appeared in a four days trial in the Children's Court. Um, I had the great privilege of being appointed for a mother who has an intellectual disability whose child was removed from her care and the child was removed because the child had attained 12 years of age. The department was contacted because the mother's sister was concerned that the child had emotionally outgrown her mother. Of course, it didn't help that the sister was offering the child a pony, a life on acreage, and various other incentives to move from mother's care. And the sister didn't want to actually confront her sister about her concerns about the care of the child. She wanted to use the department and the leverage of the department to get what she wanted and what she wanted was the child to live with her. The matter that the matter went to a four day trial is extraordinary because generally that doesn't happen in Queensland. If it went to a one day trial, it would again be outstanding. In Queensland, people with disability lose their children every day and they lose them in circumstances where generally they don't have access to legal representation 
and generally, let's be honest about it, where they do have access to legal representation, the representation isn't what it should be. Lawyers need to step up and accept a level of responsibility for how they practice law and for the impact that their failure to understand their clients has on the system. The linchpin of this trial was the evidence primarily of two witnesses. One witness was the mother. The mother is in her 30s. She was removed from her own family by the department when she was a child. She was severely abused. Her feet were misshapen from the level of abuse that she'd suffered at the hands of her father. There were six siblings in the group and all of them were placed in different foster homes and all of them were abused. She had no trust of the department. So when the department came to her and said, we have concerns about how you care for your child, she wasn't listening because her experience of the department was they were the people who took her away from her siblings. They were the people who left her vulnerable to being abused. Although we applied to the court to have her treated as a special witness and the court granted that request, her evidence was poor. People with disability, particularly intellectual disability, don't understand the legal framework. They expect people not to continually question them about things. When you challenge a person with intellectual disability in the witness box, they're liable to agree with you or become upset or withdraw. They're unlikely to say, like if you cross-examine someone in the magistrate's court or in the family court, um, no, that didn't happen. Yes, I've told you the truth. They will acquiesce. And because they acquiesce, they make difficult witnesses. They also make difficult witnesses because often their recollection of events isn't consecutive. Often it revolves around stories and experiences and events and days. And unlike you and I, they can't sit down with a statement and reinvent in their mind what happened and what may have happened and then recreate the sequence of events. I'm someone who remembers faces. I remembered a face this morning. Can't quite work out where I meant the face, but I remember the face. I can reconstruct the history of our meeting through talking to other people, through, through going back in my mind and being able to put together that chronological order. It isn't a facility that people with intellectual disability have. And so, mum was a poor witness. The other critical witness in the case was the social worker who interviewed the child with mum and with the mum's sister. The social worker read a lot of material. He'd done his homework. He met the child in his chambers on Wickham Terrace. The mother was very anxious. She hadn't seen her daughter at that point for over three months. She turned up three hours early. He said that it represented a level of guilt on her behalf, that she would be at that interview so early. When the mother went into the interview with the social worker, she said, I'm concerned. Those weren't the words she used, but that was the message that she was conveying. She was concerned she hadn't seen her daughter for such a long time, and how would her daughter react? The social worker hadn't anticipated that issue, and in fact, what he did was he brought the child into a room with the mother and the sister who had effectively used the department to take the child from the mother. The child was confused. The child was in an alien environment. The mother was upset. The whole interview lasted for five minutes. The social worker said it was the worst interview that he had ever conducted. But he didn't do it again. He used it as the basis for a recommendation that the child be removed from the mother. When I asked him under cross-examination why he didn't consider perhaps interviewing the child and the mother and sister in their home environments, 
where they would feel comfortable, where they could make a cup of tea and relax, where they would have time to um, feel familiar and reconstruct, like I would with my friend, the events that may have happened. He said, I don't do that. This is a forensic exercise. Why would I do that? He had no concept about the anxiety that mother felt, about her lack of preparation, and about the very real confrontation that she anticipated that did occur in that scenario. Ultimately, we were successful. And ultimately, the magistrate only ordered a short-term order in the case of that mother. But my experience as the adult guardian is that it is a very regular experience for mothers to find themselves pregnant. Like all of us, they want to have children. Like all of us, they want to belong. Like all of us, they want to have a loving sexual relationship. When they get pregnant, it is almost inevitable that the department will remove the child at the time of birth. And there will be a fight to return the child to the mother so that some assessment can occur of how the mother is able to parent that child. And so some consideration of whether or not there is a capacity to be able to support the mother and the child is available. There is absolutely no consideration of how breaking that bond affects not only the mother, but the child. There is no money available in Queensland to support women who have a disability to parent their children. There's money available to the mother for her support needs. There's money available to the child if the child goes into care, but there is no money to support that relationship in that scenario. And in fact, the example that I gave you with the children's court um, is a very telling example because the child removed from the mother will get support the sister will get support to care for her niece. That money and support is not available to the mother to care for her own child in her own home. And so for the women who have these children who are then removed on the basis that there's child protection issues, the need, the want, the desire for children doesn't go. And they go and get pregnant again and the whole scenario is repeated again. I was thinking about the implications when I was writing this speech of last week's election. And I was thinking about some of the things that we might do to be able to improve the risk that is borne every day by people with disability who come into contact with our legal system. The risk isn't borne by the system because the system has mechanisms in place to protect itself. The risk is borne by those who actually find themselves in the system. If they are going into the criminal justice system, what you will generally find is that when interviewed by the police, a person with intellectual disability will acquiesce and agree with all of the things put to them. By the time the interview is concluded, the possibility of a defence is almost always gone because regardless of where that person was or what they were doing or what their motivation was, in a situation where they're placed in an interview with a person of authority and questioned without proper support, they will acquiesce and agree. We have well taught people in our community who have intellectual disability that it is better to acquiesce and agree with authority than it is to oppose them. So by the time the interview is over, generally the opportunity to do anything about those charges is gone. But when they go to the local magistrates court, which are among the busiest courts in our system, with magistrates who have lists which are very long, duty lawyers who have clients who are numerous and resources who are poor, the chances that they will actually be able to speak to anyone who can give them advice about what they can do in that scenario is very remote. And when they get into the courtroom, they don't have the capacity and skills to present themselves to a magistrate in a way that actually gives them a chance. On one or two occasions, when we were able to put in the resources to properly defend people, magistrates were prepared to listen. 
when there is evidence before magistrates about intellectual disability and its impact, about what it means to be part of the other and not part of the mainstream, about the power differential and how it means you can't speak out, not only because you can't think of the need to speak out, but because you can't understand the context in which you're required to speak out. Magistrates are, in my experience, prepared to listen. So while there are many calls for judicial education that I support, I think that we need to look closer at home. And where I would like to look is at my fellow lawyers. When I did the bar practice course last uh, May and June, I realised a few things. Um, first of all, I realised that I was much older than I actually anticipated. Um, and uh, doing late night study was not something that I easily recovered from. So I did the eight weeks of the bar practice course and then went to bed for two weeks to recover after it. So that was one of my um, discoveries. Another of my discoveries was that I'd actually forgotten more law than I think I ever knew. Um, things seem to have moved on incredibly and it was a great privilege to be able to meet with some of the leading senior counsel in our state and judges and to talk to them about how they think about things. Not about what the criminal code says or what the Family Law Act says, but how do you think through problems and how do you think through decisions and that was an incredible privilege. The other thing that I learnt is that lawyers don't really have the focus on justice that they should have. Now I can say that because I'm a lawyer and I'm saying it about my colleagues. I notice I'm not saying it at the Bar Association or the Law Society, however. Um, in the whole of the Bar Practice course, there was one session on disability. If attendance at that session had not been compulsory, out of the group of 25, there would have been about three people there. Most people attended under resentment. Most people did not listen and most people did not learn. Every year that that course has been practised, Dan O'Gorman has gone and he has spent his time talking to students about disability and the law, about discrimination and the law, about how to give clients who have those sorts of problems in their lives a, a fair chance. But I've got to say, it's a message that's very hard to deliver to an audience who frankly aren't focused at that time on justice. It is very difficult in the legal profession, the private legal profession, when lawyers are so highly leveraged with high rents, high staffs, high overheads to be able to give the time and attention to clients who don't attract the funding that they need to meet their basic daily expenses. And I can tell you that every day that I do a legal aid matter is a day that costs me money. It's not that I resent doing it, I enjoy doing it. It is some of the best law that I practice. But the reality is that the small amount of money that legal aid is able to fund means that lawyers who do that work do it out of their own pocket. And it's not something that is generally understood or recognised in the community. The perception of lawyers as money grabbing denies the fundamental reality that while a few make a lot, a lot make little, and the overheads of law are highly expensive. So let's stop bleating for a little bit and think about how we can shift some of the risks that people with disability suffer when they come into confrontation with our legal system. You can have dreams and you can have long lists, but what tends to happen with dreams and long lists is nothing gets done. My dream for this year was to lose 30 kilos and I can assure you that I've probably put on another five and the 30 is still well in place. So you need to have realistic goals if you're going to change anything and that includes the legal system. So in this can-do state, there are basically four things that I think, if they were addressed, would make a massive difference to the experience of people with disability in Queensland when they come into contact with the legal system. It won't solve everything, but it will start to make a massive change. And frankly, if every year the government realistically looked at four issues and addressed them, we would have massive change in a very short time. 
The problem with government is that government generally is not prepared to address issues unless there is a swell of attention. The recommendations from the Law Reform Commission into the guardianship legislation have sat with the Law Reform Commission now for over two years. Lots of words written, lots of documents, but nothing has done. And the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which yesterday I was very pleased to hear our Treasurer say would definitely be going ahead even in the face of a tough budget, only happened because parents, families and friends got out literally to their politicians and started talking about the economic impact that this was having on them and on Australians. So let's talk about the four things on my wish list. Your list, wish list might be different and I'm happy to have coffee with you when I haven't had a tangle with a bus and talk about why I see my wish list as being important. The first thing I'd like to see is I'd like to stop uh, the child protection merry-go-round. Children being born and taken from their mothers so that their mothers can repeat the experience again and have multiple children to multiple fathers because of their need to be loved um, as a human being. I think one of the easiest ways to address this issue would be to provide funding to support mothers to learn to mother. In that case that I was talking about, the mother who has intellectual disability in a system where she's been before the courts for two years is yet to be assessed for her level of intellectual disability and her capacity to, to learn. Not only do we need to put in place the supports so that these mothers will become part of their children's lives, but we need to be realistic. Some mothers will never make it no matter what we do, but they're still important to their children's lives and their children are still important to them. Why don't we have a system in Queensland that allows co-parenting, where a person from outside that parent can co-parent with the parent with disability. And perhaps it will mean that they share visitation or perhaps it will mean that they live in a special housing arrangement. But ultimately we will grow children who know their mothers. Ultimately, I think, we will grow mothers who know their children and who have richer lives and who are less likely to do it again because of that need. I think that there is absolutely no basis upon which we can argue in Queensland that if you commit a serious indictable offence like murder and manslaughter, you can get a defence under the Mental Health Act on the basis that you are unfit for trial because you don't understand the nature and effect of your decisions and because you have a mental illness or natural mental infirmity. The Court of Criminal Appeal has commented on this the government has done nothing. There was a show that I was part of on ABC Radio National last year where numerous people who have had experience of this situation talked about young offenders who ultimately go to trial and go to prison for offences like shoplifting, minor street offences, because the record of conviction gets to be so long that there really is no other option. And in prison, the level of abuse of those people is incredibly high and we are skilling them up to make them even more difficult to manage on our streets and in our housing. We need to accept that there is no reason why if someone murders and they don't have the capacity to understand what they're doing and why at that time, someone who has an intellectual disability and challenging behaviour and continuously shoplifts in Toowoomba because they don't understand and have no capacity to understand that what they're doing is wrong, should not be convicted of that offence and should not be placed in prison for that offence, should not be supported by us in prison at that offence, should not not get rehabilitation and then should be placed back out on our streets to do it all again. It just beggars belief that it is a situation that is unaddressed by government at a point in time where even the Court of Criminal Appeal has commented about this issue. The third thing on my wish, wish list is to close the biggest institution for people with intellectual disability 
and mental health in Queensland. And it's not the Park Centre for, for Mental Health and it's not Basil Stafford. The biggest place where people with intellectual disability are warehoused in Queensland is in the prison. They end up there through misadventure, through trying to fit in, through doing stupid things, through having a life of disadvantage. They end up in a system where they are re-educated in a way that simply makes them more intolerable to our society, more intolerable in housing and more difficult to support. There is really no reason why we should continue to accept that people are placed in prison as opposed to alternatives. And at the end of serving a prison term in Queensland, if you are regarded as being unsafe on the streets, you won't get probation. Disability services will not provide you with support until you get probation. You will not qualify for bail if you're facing a charge. And again, disability services will not provide you with support to establish the necessary credentials that you need to be bailed out. Jail is expensive. It doesn't work. We need to accept that and stop putting people away and start addressing the issues. Um, I guess the other thing I want to talk about is really the role of the adult guardian and I'm cognizant of time so I'm going to keep it a bit short. The role of the adult guardian is to stop abuse, neglect and exploitation. For five years I did that and by any standard you would have to say that I failed. Abuse, neglect and exploitation happens to people with intellectual disability in Queensland every day. There is no doubt about that. It happens in homes where there are no rules, no oversight, little support. It happens in accommodation where people are co-tenanted inappropriately. It happens in services where people are unwilling to put their hands up and say something went wrong. Um, it happens because people are unprepared to whistle blow. It happens because we redefine people's inappropriate behaviour as challenging behaviour. We try to work with services instead of saying we need to stop this. And one of the problems, I think, is with the language. If I'm going to abuse you or neglect you or exploit you, it doesn't sound as tough as if I'm going to assault you. And if we talk about abuse, neglect and exploitation, it's sort of icky, but we can live with it. It's not as confronting as saying that's aggravated assault or that's grievous bodily harm. I think we really need to look at the way we talk about how people with intellectual disability are treated and I think we need to confront what that really is and call it for what it really is. It is assault and assault is not acceptable and assault should be dealt with. And I think if we change that paradigm, we will change a lot of the behaviour that currently isn't addressed. Now, um, that sounds a bit like a tough note to end things on. So I would like to um, say to you all that when I thought about this, I thought, gosh, things are pretty tough, aren't they? Um, you know, it's a very difficult life to have intellectual disability in downtown Brisbane. It is tough. There's no doubt about that. It's even tougher if you're an Indigenous person who lives in Mount Isa, where you can sit under Bob Catter's sign, but you're very unlikely to get any real assistance from any politician. Um, and I know because I've been there and, and met the Riverbed people. But when you look at the history of human rights, you have got to say that over the last 60 years, many things have changed. There are many things across the globe that we would hope hadn't happened, there are many atrocities that we all hear about in the news every day that we think, how could that possibly happen in the face of the United Nations and all of the things that human rights stand for? But there are many changes. And even in the short time that I've been involved in disability in Queensland, and it is a short time, I've seen changes. The biggest change that I've seen is the conversation. People are talking about these issues. I wouldn't have been invited 
to have this conversation with you six years ago. And today, you're here and I'm here having this conversation. Human rights doesn't change overnight. It will change, but it requires perseverance, it requires clear thinking, and it requires people stepping up to take responsibility, not only blaming others, but to take responsibility for what they do every day in their lives that affects the people around them who have disability. Thank you very much. Thank you, Di. Thank you very much. That was that was spectacular. I'm looking forward to reading uh, reading your speech, the 19-page version. Um, it was remiss of me earlier not to recognise the chairman of Endeavour Foundation, especially when my bonus is due in a few weeks, <laughs> um, Grant Murdoch. And and uh, I, I mention him at a number of uh, for a number of reasons. We're here at Customs House, Uni University of Queensland downtown. We signed a memorandum of understanding with uh, the University of Queensland last week, I think it was. And, uh, and that's about um, uh, a research collaboration. It's about the fact that we now provide an accredited uh, certificate two in literacy and technology uh, for people uh, uh, with intellectual disability. Um, it's about the fact that we're collaborating with their MBA program uh, to assist us to work with uh, Endeavour Industries to provide more meaningful work for a number of our uh, uh, employees who have a disability. Um, many of you wouldn't be aware that Endeavour Foundation is the largest employer of people with a disability in Australia, uh, over 1,800 people. Um, it, uh, having said all that, um, and, and we've got a number of other initiatives like uh, No More Than Four housing uh, initiative, which means we're reducing a lot of our nine bed and 20 bed, uh, and there's no other word for it, uh, institutions. Uh, down to, to full bed and I have to say um, in 30 years time I think they'll be looked upon as institutions as well but you have to you have to start somewhere and you have to improve things and that's what we're attempting to do so many of the challenges that that Di spoke of uh, are, are very real ones for the Endeavour Foundation and we're embracing those and uh, and uh, hopefully uh, improving the lot of people with disability the other thing I want to do is was to thank uh, my staff for putting this on I, I'm just going to uh, ad hoc invite uh, Mark uh, Rymers, who's, who's the director of our um, community and advocacy support program at Endeavour Foundation, because he's going to quickly talk about a program that might uh, might surprise Di that we're about to uh, em embark on with the uh, Department of Justice and Attorney Generals. And I, I won't steal his thunder, I'll let him talk. But I also wanted to acknowledge um, the interpreters, the people who come up here and just do the most fabulous job. And I always just think they're, they're just brilliant. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and I'm, I'm constantly amazed because, you know, there's a time delay from what I say and how they sign and how, you know, they're usually women because men couldn't do this. Um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And it's just, <laughs> what did you say then? <laughs> That's the other problem I have. I'm not overly trustful, you know. Um, but I'll stop. But thank you again. And I'll hand over to Mark. And, and please, uh, I won't forget, Andrea. The next, uh, uh, did I bring my glasses? I did. The next speaker series is uh, in June, on the 8th of June. It's here again. Uh, the speaker is Professor Nick Lennox. And um, he, <laughs> I'm not... <laughs> I'm not sure I should read out this, but his topic is love in the time of randomised controlled trials and beyond. <laughs> so we, we might get some drugs or something, I'm not sure. Um, but Nick's a fabulous speaker and he, he works at the uh, Queensland Centre for um, Adult Intellectual Disability and uh, uh, does some amazing work with people. But I'll just hand over to Mark. Uh, after Mark finishes, um, I know everyone's busy and you'll want to get away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm probably stealing David's th thunder for a bit later in the year, but um, we've been working with the Department of Justice and the Attorney General 
to do something about the lack of awareness of disability issues by staff in that department. And within Endeavour, we've got a program called Walk a Mile in My Shoes, which is a program that staff who don't have experience in disability services get to work. Um, they get to do a bit of training and then to work alongside um, people with disabilities, either in a lifestyle and learning centre or in one of the um, Australian disability enterprises on a work site for a day to experience what it is. Staff within Endeavour find it an amazing experience that um, raises their awareness about people with disability and the need for the sorts of supports that we have. So we were a bit lucky in that the, um, the state government 10 year plan was rolled out and disability awareness training is a part of that for every government department. And we've finished negotiating with Department of Justice and Attorney General for Walk Mile to be rolled out in DJAG, to be rolled out across the state. Um, the, there's a business services um, group within that who are going to start that rollout. But our aim is that everybody who works in DJAG in a frontline role where they have exposure to people with disability, so in the courts, in the courthouses, frontline staff will do walk a mile, get some exposure. We know that it's not going to be enough, but at least might highlight people's awareness to what they don't know about disability and might give them some encouragement to further explore. So I just wanted to let you know that. Thanks for coming this morning and thank you.